was just telling him what an amazing bunch of kids you are and that you all love Jesus and that you all want to follow Jesus and they're all so excited because they love Jesus too and so do I and we were thinking he is the best friend you could ever 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 have Jesus as your friend and we're thinking about well all the amazing things he did all the miracles that he did you know he turned water into wine he he made the people that couldn't walk walk he opened blind eyes so they could see he gave people open their ears so they could hear but you know out of all those miracles that Jesus did do you know what the most favorite thing and the most important thing to Jesus was was hanging out with his heavenly daddy he just loved to hang out and just talk and hang out with him and all it is Jesus wants us to do the same is to come and hang out with our heavenly daddy and that's just talking to him about the best thing we did today he loves to hear when you rode your bike or what when you went to the park or you hung out or you did something good he wants to know what you're worried about as well he wants to know all things and he wants you to pray for people he just loves it but anyway I have to go because you know what my favorite thing to do is hang out with my heavenly daddy so me and my unicorn are going to the other side to hang out with daddy <laughs> Morning everyone. Such a beautiful day this morning and just looking at all the gardens and the, the having the sun and the mountains. We are so blessed here in Kyogo. It is so beautiful. And this morning John and I want to welcome you to communion and if you'd like to get some crackers and some juice so that you're ready to have communion with us that'd be great if that's what you would like to do. I read from John Chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We are called and blessed to cherish not only the fact that Jesus died for us, but also what he continues to teach us by his word. We are made in his image so that we can be holy since he is holy. The world is definitely a different place at the moment. Many people are feeling fearful or anxious about the changes that are happening. COVID, lockdown, the fall of Kabul and the earthquakes and floods that we hear about on the news can really push us towards fear. But we, as followers of Jesus, and put fear behind us. Joshua 1 9 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, how can we be strong and courageous? We can trust our God, who is the creator of all things, and who sent us Jesus to show us in human terms the nature of God's love. Luke chapter 12 verses 6 and 7 says that God even remembers the sparrows that fall and he numbers the hairs on our head. Surely our amazing God is with us and loving us through these times. Something simple I do whenever I find myself worrying about all these things happening is to simply say out loud, trust God. Sometimes I might say it a hundred times a day. But saying it out loud seems to create a connection for me and it puts my life into perspective, affirming the reality of the awesomeness of who our God really is. He is the Father who sent his Son Jesus so that we might truly live and have the eternal life that we've heard about in John 3.16 just before. Not in some distant future, but right now. Right now, we can choose to follow and to trust. So let's pray together before we take our communion. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son in human form so that we might see demonstrated how to live a life totally trusting who you are. We pray this morning for peace to reign in our hearts 
and that we might be reminded to trust God every moment of the day. As we take our communion, we experience the joy of knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So John and I invite you all to share in taking communion with us this morning as we remember that Jesus died so that we might live an abundant life in communion with God. Let us thank him together and eat and drink.
Hi everyone, uh, hope you're doing well. I want to talk with you today, uh, my, the title of the message is Choose Unity. And I think this is a very important thing to think about in these times when there's lots of opportunity for anything but unity. And so I've got a number of scriptures that I want to read, but before we do that I'm just going to pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are present with us always and you want to lead us deeper into your heart and you want to uh, reveal to us deeper understanding uh, of the nature of your kingdom. And so we ask that you would be bringing, you being the spirit of revelation and understanding, bring that revelation and understanding to us to walk in accordance with your kingdom so that you get the glory that you deserve in the church. Amen. Alright, we're going to start with Philippians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 1 through to 7. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. It does go on there, but I feel that's the appropriate part to stop here for what we're considering today. Um, these are some, you know, Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, there was some obvious tensions going on and he was addressing that we see later on that he was he, he said in chapter 4 I plead with you Odia and I plead with Sintisha to be of the same mind in the Lord so there were some tensions within the group for whatever reason not sure what it was but here Paul's saying very clearly if you have received anything from being in the kingdom of God if you feel encouraged about the fact that you're united with Christ. And in, in Ephesians, he tells us that we're seated with him in heavenly realms. Um, if you have any comfort from his love and any common sharing in the spirit or, or fellowship with the spirit, in the spirit, um, if any tenderness and compassion. So he's saying basically, you know, Come on, guys, if you've received anything from God, if you've experienced these good things from the kingdom, then make my joy complete by being united, by being one. Um, in a similar passage, uh, sorry, similar, similar kind of vibe, we see at the start of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, from verse 10 to 12, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some of Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. He was disturbed by the divisions going on, but it's what's really intense is how he says um, he doesn't want there to be divisions, but he wants them to be perfectly united in mind and thought. And you know, is that... You've got to ask, is that suggesting a uniformity of thinking? I think um, 
you know, is that is that what he's saying there? The, the thought that we all have to think exactly the same about everything. I mean, in that first passage that we read, he was saying, you know, being like-minded. Um, I'm sure you're all aware, most of you are aware, that he's not actually calling for uniformity of thinking in everything. And this is, this is what I think is, is really important. But I guess the question is, um, how do we have one mind um, if we disagree? Now, there's obviously some disagreement um, on issues that are going on today. That's, that's clear. And is Paul saying that we can't, we can't have those disagreements about things, so we have to then all think the same thing? So who decides who thinks what? Like, which is, who's, whose side is right that we're thinking of? Well, everyone who's disagreeing thinks that they're right. <laughs> That's, that's why there's disagreement. And so, what do we do with this? How do we have one mind but still disagree? I think part of the answer is found in verse 5. It gives just a bit, uh, I think, a, a clearer understanding there. Verse 5 it says, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to explain um, what Jesus had as his mindset, which was, he was God, but he didn't um, try and grasp onto that equality with God to be used to his own advantage, but he, he, um, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Verse 3 was saying it's, it's all about humility. Here's the thing, I think the central focus of what he's saying is that it's about your relationships with one another and in our relationships with one another we need to have the same mindset as Jesus it doesn't mean we have to think the same on every issue in life but in our relationships we need to have the same mindset as Jesus which is become a servant in humility serve one another in love And so you might think one thing about something and someone else thinks something different and you might think they're very wrong. But if you let that issue trump your ability to show love and kindness to someone, then you're getting it wrong. Here's a question for you. Who do you think is responsible, responsible for division in the church? I think, um, you know, sometimes we can perhaps, perhaps over-spiritualize the situation. Um, not in, okay, so obviously I'm sure we would all uh, acknowledge the fact that Satan wants to bring division. Okay, uh, and... I'm sure most of us are aware that he can influence things. But let me just be super clear about this. It's not like there's this... Like the, the forces of evil are just this, this oppressive thing that comes upon us and we have no... You know, it's just like, oh no, this is all him. Well, can I just say in response to the question, who is responsible for division in the church? You are. You are responsible. Your attitude towards others contribute to whether there's division or not. Your words uh, towards someone, but also about someone, is is responsible, contributing um, responsibility to the to the division, whether there's division in the church. Your behaviour around other people or towards them 
that it's you and me obviously I'm talking to myself as well but I want you to understand that we all need to take responsibility if there's division in the church it's because of people choosing and I was thinking about division I think division is a collective disconnection it's when a group of people decide to disconnect from another group of people that was once one it's a collective decision or choice to disconnect and disconnection is a chosen response to discomfort and so understanding then that you get to choose whether there's division in the church Uh, Hebrews 10.24 tells us to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So you might go, I'm not doing anything, but are you spurring other people on towards love and good deeds? You are responsible for if there's division in the church. Let's not make this a hyper-spiritual thing of some evil forces bringing it. Well, I mean, I totally acknowledge the fact that Satan and his cohort want to influence and infiltrate, but he only can if we give him space. Come on, let's be real about that. He can only do something if we give him space. That means if you, in your thinking, starts aligning with what Satan would want you to, then you're giving him the space to bring a wedge and, and you know, emphasize thinking that's actually divisive or whatever it is that it's it's you give him space and I think this is just super important for us to remember we may think differently on something but you choose whether to connect or disconnect you choose love is not disconnection if you have an opinion and someone else thinks differently and you choose no, oh well, and you, in your heart you push away, you want distance from someone, then you are choosing division. More so, you're, I mean, you're choosing division from that person, whoever you disconnected from. But let's say you think something and this person thinks differently and you go, nah, and then you look at someone else who thinks like you and then you go, they think blah 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 no nah, that's division you choose it or not it is okay to have conversation it's totally right and proper to actually talk it out I mean it's it there's no I'm not at all suggesting that we don't have conversation about the things that are going on and we have proper robust conversations and I mean actually talk about it to get to you know having it all out there I mean um, I think a lot of us struggle to have a proper robust conversation all the way to the end um, when it gets hard we we shut it off or um, we we deflect and change topics or whatever I mean when I think the majority of us struggle to have a conversation all the way to the end. So I'm not even, I'm not remotely suggesting that we don't talk about it. I'm actually saying we need to get better at talking about it. But we also need to get way better at making sure that our hearts don't push people away if they disagree. If we feel the discomfort from someone else, let's say someone else is angry at you because you think differently to them, you still choose whether you disconnect from them. If you if you are someone like me who naturally would want to withdraw if someone's angry, well, your withdrawing is your choice. My withdrawing is my choice. I choose to connect or disconnect, and we've got to get that clear. If you're going to disconnect from someone, then you are um, taking steps to bring division to the church. So you are responsible for any division in the church. We need to get way. Uh, just really clear in our minds and in our heads of the fact that um, 
Disconnection is our choice. Division is our responsibility, whether we're uh, choosing to connect or not is our responsibility. Oops, going the wrong way. Have a think about that. Have a think about you and the state of your heart in regards to conversations around, you know, the government, conversations around lockdown, conversations around vaccinations. Um, how is your heart standing in the middle of it all towards people who think differently to you? That is your choice. You can't blame the other person for your chosen response to them. It's totally okay to disagree, but it is not okay to disconnect when we're meant to be a community of love. And last week's message, was I used that, that verse from uh, John um, 13, where it was, he said, the world will know that you're my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus did not disconnect from his disciples, even though they were so immature sometimes, just like us. And he didn't disconnect. We can't disconnect if we are disciples of Jesus. Because disciple literally means, I am learning to become you. I'm learning to be like you. That's what a disciple of someone is. I'm, I'm laying down everything to to imitate you so that I become a little you. That's what we are when we say we're a disciple of Christ. We are wanting to become a little Christ, a little representation, a little copy of Jesus. Well, you can't be a copy of Jesus if you're going to choose to disconnect from people. That is a wrong um, image of Jesus. He did not do that. We cannot do that if we call ourselves disciples. Let's be clear on that. Um, and here we go in, in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, this is the famous, very famous passage and a lot of people read a part of this for um, weddings, which is appropriate because weddings are meant to be, marriage is meant to be a, an amazing image of love. But let's just, let's just read over this from verse 1 down to 7. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now we can read that and in our uh, finite brains that, that really don't always comprehend uh, the fullness of God. We read that and we can justify ourselves. So we can say, well, it's loving for me to tell someone that they're, you know, shame someone out for what they think. Because in shaming them out, maybe it will make them realize that they're wrong and so eventually that they'll come to think rightly. Well, can I just say that that's not okay to think that way. That is not in line with what he's saying here because then he goes on to really paint so clearly what love looks like. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Not rude, it is not self-seeking. Not easily angered. Does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Always trusts. It always hopes, it always perseveres. Love oh. never fails. And now these three remain faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. Then goes on to say that where there's prophecies, they'll stop. Tongues will be stilled. Um, and and then ends up that, that conversation about saying, or that, that passage saying, th these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, one thing that was so encouraging at our, uh, the church's 40th birthday was hearing over and over the, um, 
the testimonies of people saying that when they came in, this was a place of love, a place of family. And um, that was the testimony repeatedly. It was this experience of love, an experience of family. And, um, and that's because that's, who's got, that, who, that's who God has birthed us to be as a church. We are our, our DNA. And our DNA as a church is love and family. And so we are going to continue to be that. We were that. We are that. And we will be a place of love. We will not let divisive ideas um, uh, infiltrate that. We will not let different opinions cause us to no longer be a place of love. We are a people of love. It's because we've experienced the Father's love. We've experienced each other's expression of the Father's love. We will not let that go. This is who we are and we will continue to be that no matter what is going on in the world, no matter what opinions we have about whatever, we will be a people of love, of unity. We will choose unity. We will choose to be patient with one another. We'll choose to be kind. We'll choose not to dishonor one another. We will continue to be a people of love and um, and and you know it's like that thing of um, us calling ourselves disciples being little imitators of Jesus the ultimate expression of that imitation is Jesus love we will be disciples of Jesus we have been we are and we will continue to be disciples of Jesus, who is the ultimate expression of love. This is who we are. We need to lean into that. We need to call on the Holy Spirit to help us to make sure that we don't make um, these opinions about stuff get in the way of our ability to show kindness to each other and show that we want to connect with one another despite our different ideas about the world. We will not follow the pattern of this world, but we will continue to be an expression of love. We will choose unity because that's who we are. That's who God has destined us to be. And so we will rest in that, knowing that we will be. And I'm just so thankful. None of us are wanting to walk away from Jesus. And so if we're not wanting to walk away from Jesus, then we will continue to lean into Jesus. We will continue to experience his love so that we can love each other well. We will choose unity. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace towards us. We thank you that you want us to be united in the way that we relate to each other. We want to have the same mindset as you, Jesus, who's not trying to lord it over other people or trying to have power over people but rather humbling ourselves becoming servants of each other loving each other well we want to choose unity for your glory's sake jesus just as you prayed that we would be one we want to walk that out and we pray that your holy spirit will enable us to do that in jesus name amen bless you guys Love you so much. Let's walk this out.